LOS Tidris. Hothead, nice to be in orbit. Jump 5821 complete. Roger that, Galactica. We're living in a time where a lot of the notions that were pure fantasy even 10, 20 years ago are now becoming a reality. We're like lab rats in an illegal experiment. We're clones. There's a great desire, I think, among science fiction fans to create worlds that are tangible to them and that they can enter into. How do you make a spaceship in space on a movie screen that I can believe? That is movie magic and how it transports us. Scientists carefully test theories step by step, cautiously building on the work of those before them. Decade by decade, they craft our world with knowledge and innovation. Science fiction writers, almost overnight, single-handedly built entire worlds so rich and dense they rival our own. How does one build an entire world that feels so real and in turn inspires a new generation of scientists? Vincenzo Natale, a master of seamless world building, has been called upon for his advice and his wise words for a team of filmmakers in the early stages of crafting a world for their science fiction film. Brief with the idea, Natalie will guide them through his process. What would he do if this was his project? Well, I've been presented with a, a fictional film, uh, and, and the question is, how would I approach designing that movie and designing a world to that film? Uh, so the concept is um, we're in a world where there's a new technology that's been developed um, in Prestithis where uh, AI intelligence is embedded in a hand, in mechanical synthetic hands. And of course that technology, is, it often does in these situations, goes wrong. Uh, frequently what I do is just find images that I like. You know, I start collecting things, kind of collaging um, textures, photographs, artwork, and, and I actually create a file of them. It also becomes a reference point for working with other designers. With a collection of ideas, Natalie gives his best advice on what will become the film's location. Um, it's just a generic warehouse, as you see right now, or factory space. But with the, the manufacturing of the, the hands, lots of conveyor belts, tracks with hooks coming down. Um, I would love to see at some point have like a, a trough of some sort of chemical that the actual hand gets submerged in. A sense of place is essential, uh, especially when you're telling a science fiction story because to some degree it's a character in the story. And, and certainly in the case of my first film, Cube, the cube was maybe the main character. And, uh, and we put a lot of work actually into designing not only what you saw on the screen, but conceptually how the cube functioned. Um, because it wasn't inert, it was a environment that was always changing and, uh, and it had to follow very strict rules. Okay, cool. Well, I like, I like the industrial nature of it. I like the feeling that it's real and it's not, it's not typically science fiction. Yeah, you know, it feels like it feels like well, there's a practical reality to making prosthetic hands, and this is what it is. Absolutely. Uh, in the case of Cube, there was just an inherent symmetry to the design of the Cube that I wanted to exploit, that I thought was visually very powerful. And in the case of Splice, um, there was actually a palette to the film that I thought was uh, intrinsically important to telling the story. The film is, is bifurcated between the lab world, which is very cool and clinical, and then this barn where the creature ends up, which is kind of harkens back to Mary Shelley in a more gothic kind of milieu. And, uh, and it was the contrast between those two worlds that I thought was the visual hook of the movie. The mid-90s, when I started working on the idea of it, 
it was kind of a defunct technology. Like people weren't talking about cloning very much until the sheep had been cloned. And, uh, and then it sort of suddenly rebounded and became the in vogue technology. And I, I thought, well, from a filmmaking standpoint, this is really just the tip of an iceberg. I mean, it's a really, I think, I mean, that's sort of the next industrial revolution. That's, things are going to get very weird <laughs> in the near future for us. Vincenzo's co-writer on Cube, Graham Manson, knows clones. He co-created Orphan Black, the authority on clones in pop culture. It takes place in the real world, but the truth about our advancement with clones is being leaked. It's definitely, you know, it's part of my taste is weird, and a lot of that is sci-fi. It's what I really liked, you know, growing up. <laughs> Development process uh, for this series was really long, almost 10 years um, for, to, from the point of John pitching me the opening scene. <laughs> that was all we had at the beginning, pretty quickly we got to clones because twins sort of exhausted itself. When we first realized it was about clones, a good friend of mine, uh, Kasima Herter, who has become the science advisor on the show, we just, you know, sat and we drank beer and we talked about science. I'm not a scientist. I don't, I'm not very good at the science, really. I'm better at the concepts. We're constantly finding this symbiosis with what we're working on, with what's coming up in the news, you know? We get into, like, genetic patenting, and the, and the Supreme Court makes its decision on patenting of synthetic so-called DNA. We try to ground it in real science um, as much as possible, and then allow ourselves that little sort of science fiction jump-off point. It's not five minutes into the future. It's really just the question, sort of what's going on behind the lab door that we don't know about. I always find that some of the most unsettling, scary, and relevant type of, you know, way to get across these concepts. Technology is a pace with the ideas of sci-fi writers, you know, which is the best thing about writing sci-fi. It's the ability to comment on what's going on in the real world. I've had the opportunity to listen to uh, some science fiction writers when they talk about their craft. Part of their role is to lead the engineering. Their storytelling is going to lay out a construct and, and mission discussions that then we as engineers need to follow along. My first memory is Star Wars. If you think of Star Wars being your first experience of movies and the type of movie that that uh, particular film is, I guess for me it's become a lifetime of, of exploration. You know, so many of the movies that I loved as a kid when it was you know, pre-digital, so everything is largely a physical effect. I feel the people in those movies, in, in terms of the people who made them, would like Jar Jar Binks have worked better if it was a guy in a suit? Maybe. Gollum, though, proved that maybe we can connect with like a digital character. I think some of that is, is speaks to the idea of movie magic and how they, it transports us. And, you know, again, I think even something like Gollum is just ultimately an outgrowth of the work of like a guy like Lon Chaney who would like physically adapt himself to these sorts of roles. So t to me, I always see the continuum uh, sort of behind it. The matrix behind the, the movie for me is the interesting part. The film's conceptual artist has drafted an early look at our murderous hands. Natalie stops by to offer his thoughts. I really like the aesthetic of that future as visualized by the past. Right old prosthetic factories and glove-making factories from, say, the 50, oh, 40s right, and the yeah. 50s, but then brought in some of the modern technology. So it would be neat to have that, um, that contrast. In terms of 
the kind of mechanics that are involved and and the kind of technology involved it has everything to do with the tone of the script right so um i mean i like the stripped down version of it i'd be curious to know what science could do to evolve it and you can grow skin cultures and so on so there's yeah, a possibility that really the skin cool. on it is real skin that's right it doesn't have to be synthetic yeah you have some of the scenarios of the hands um, <laughs> taking a life of their own when they're on the body, and then they sort of that's like fun. evolve okay, so from it's there, be, and they're running away. It's going to be a factory of rebelling hands. Exactly. I like it. Okay, great. The line between what works and doesn't work is is not an obvious one, and it and it it changes from project to project. What plays as reality in Star Wars will not play as reality in 2001. A space odyssey and it's just a question of creating the right reality for the film you're making from the beginning you know since people watched the lumiere brothers train station movie one of the great goals of film has been to immerse an audience in the reality and when people saw that film of a train pulling into a station for the first time they ran out of the theater because they thought the train was in the theater and, and I think that experience is something that filmmakers and audiences are constantly searching for. And the, the latest spate of 3D films is an attempt to do that. For me, that's one of the great joys of filmmaking is you get to play God. <laughs> and that's fun. If you explore the SpaceX property, uh, a lot of the names of, of, of meeting rooms are, are, are named after, you know, famous physicists or, or Han Solo from Star Wars. And so you can see, you know, even from just touring the facility, the impact that science fiction has had on, on, the, on the company culture. I think a lot of people say it's, it's about escape. I'm not sure actually science fiction is about escape. I think it's about, I actually think it's more about f facing and, and, and understanding than anything else. Uh, and so I think it's, it's always been about exploration, but not actually, it's exploration of us through the cipher of, of a new world or, or new beings or the sort of inventions around um, the, what's possible or, or what the potentially what's out there that we don't know. You know, is a movie like Godzilla, um, you know, is obviously about so much more than just a giant lizard stomping on a city. And yet, the giant lizard stomping on a city allows us to understand what more it's ultimately the movie's about. Over five seasons of Battlestar Galactica, these ciphers ran rampant. As an actor, it was Michael Hogan's job to give the audience a familiar human face to relate to in a world of starships and autonomous robots. The issues that were tackled in uh, Battlestar Galactica in retrospect, the artificial intelligence taking over the things we created coming back to haunt us. And, uh, the having children, the possibility of a fertility rate going to zero, going, well, we got to start having children as opposed to cutting down, et cetera, the tackle of that issue. If it wasn't sci-fi, so you were once removed going, this is sci-fi, so we're safe, Battlestar Galactica tackled all of those issues, whereas if you're doing a straight drama, going, we're going to do a suicide bombing uh, show. That can be said on a science fiction show. It can't be said on your normal, on your normal drama, I don't think. That's only in retrospect. Military people, a lot of military people would come to my table because I'm the XO. They tell me that they've uh, been overseas, they've fought, they got injured, and they got taken out, and they got repaired, and then went back, etc. But they just want to come and talk to me and realize you're talking about 
what we did down on the planet, the suicide bombing and all of this stuff. And you're watching this overseas and this is, whoa, whoa, your money's no good at my table, man. Um, so that, that, that was an eye opener. She's already dead. It's interesting. Uh, I am in the twilight of my career. And uh, I can see that I have an immense amount of respect and understanding now for sci fi that I didn't have before Battlestar Galactica. And twilight of my career doesn't mean that in a sad way. What a gift, man. Cheers. <laughs> Think about things like uh, Jules Verne, Voyage to the Moon. Uh, you, you certainly uh, get inspired by that as a kid, and then later on, uh, you become a, a scientist or an engineer, uh, and now we're actually inventing the mechanisms that were imagined in books like that. With the location figured out, and the designer taking steps at the hands, the props designer will populate the new world with details and all things practical. Natali shares his take. In the time before silicon, you really couldn't do anything that no. was that realistic. But silicon, the way light Exists. Um, beautiful. passes through silicone is very much like skin. It has, it reflects from beneath the surface. Like, look at this. We can see the veins. And it's not even, this isn't even painted yet. Right, so. no. And there's no hair on it. Or... No. When we did the replica of Julian, it was, I've never really encountered one that was that realistic. I mean, I was, you could look at him inches away from his face and you would swear to God it was really Julian. So this is a dry ice canister that we made for a rig. You could have potentially a hand or something come out of here. I like this because all of the uh, guts of it are exposed. It looks functional. It's not um, overly slick. I think it's nice to have things where you can see their inner workings, and you can see they're not uh, built for aesthetic purposes. They're no. built for functionality. The movie Alien has always been a touchstone for me because I think one of the hardest things to design is an alien, period. And I think the genius of hiring H.R. Giger to do the alien is that his, his work inherently was surrealistic in nature and felt like it wasn't part of our world at all. H.R. Giger did all the alien work, and Ron Cobb primarily did all of the uh, design related to the humans, and the two felt diametrically opposed to each other. And then when they actually came to building the spaceships, they used real hardware from um, World War II aircraft. And so they kludged all that stuff into the spaceship, and it, therefore it stands up, stands the test of time. You look at it now, and it looks functional. Was a bomb for the industrial terrorists who yes. wanted to destroy the hand factory. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to be a makeup effects artist when I was a kid. I went to the hospital because I took a cast of my own face. Oh my gosh! And, uh, they had to cut it off. So I have a real appreciation for this stuff, and I love I love using air bladders. I mean, as extraordinary as digital effects can be, I don't think there's ever replacing something that's physically in the space Unless with the you actors. Have the blood and everything, it's, yeah. And you can photograph something like this at very close proximity. Um, and, and once you goop it up, obviously, yeah. uh, it, it'll look great. The fifth nation should commit itself of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. You, because I keep getting confused. You were there for the finale? For the very last episode, yeah. That's where we actually first met was on the set. Yeah, because I looked yeah. off camera. We were shooting in Adama's quarters, and uh, 
I saw Ron Moore. So they said cut, and I went off and said, Moore, what are you doing here, man? And he said, I want to introduce you to Garrett Reisman, the astronaut who's been in space for 94 days. And you told me about watching Battlestar while you were in space and tethering by the way, monitor by the way, to your it was, wrist. It was 95 days. Oh, 95 oh, days. Oh, yeah, <laughs> shit up. 95 days. When you get to space, uh, what they do for you is for morale, they'll, 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 get, they'll let you write a list of people that you would like to chat with while you're up in space. Yeah. And so I wrote, uh, I'd like to talk to Ron Moore and David Icke, you know, for uh, Battlestar. And we chatted about, about, about the show, what I thought of the show, yeah. and more importantly, what it was like to watch the show up in space. And, and when, I, when I talked to Ron and, and David, I said, uh, I got to tell you one thing that seems very strange to me about that yeah. is you got all this artificial gravity, you got all these people walking around. Why would you deprive your characters yeah. of the very best part about being up in space, which is that you can fly like a superhero <laughs> all the time? It's like the best thing. Yep. And he said to me, Garrett, he goes, do you have any idea how expensive it is yeah. for the special effects to make everybody float all the time? Yeah, like, I'm yeah. Like, all right, I get it. Long I get it, man. Can I put it back? <laughs> <laughs> But my opinion is, is that uh, the strength of, of um, Battlestar was not in the special effects or the realism. Uh, uh, the strength uh, 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 with any entertainment is always in the story. So if it's if it's if you if you sacrifice some realism to to make a really good story, I think that's perfectly permissible. Yeah. And the only time that might be different is if you are trying to obviously if you're shooting a documentary or reenactment, but if you're trying, if you're if your express purpose is to capture it as genuinely as possible, especially if it's something historical, like Apollo 13. Yeah. Then, if, then, then of course, it becomes important to get it right. My first memory is Star Wars. And in so many ways, I still, this to this day, I, you know, so many years, decades later, think that's so much of what I've been looking for in movies is that, um, you know, I'm searching for the exact way I felt when I saw Star Wars for the first time at the University Theater on Bloor Street. And, and that moment of awe and wonder and discovery and, and the wonderful thing is you can find that exact moment all over the place in movies where you get transported to that moment of wonder and amazement. In creating a world, there, there are many, many tools that you have at your disposal, not all of them obvious. Actually, I took a lot of inspiration from what George Lucas went through when he made Star Wars, because certainly when he made that film, there was, people didn't have any concept of what it could be. And even as they were shooting it, famously, the crew was ridiculing him and he was, it kind of looked like a disaster in the making. But as certain pieces of the puzzle fell into place, it began to form. And what you, you, know, you think about, well, what would Star Wars be like without its opening shot? Which is very famously a Star Destroyer passing over the camera lens, and it just goes on and on. It's just so mind-blowing. And that shot wasn't in the movie until very late in its post-production. I mean, not that long before the film was completed. So how could anyone even judge that movie without that shot? How could they judge that movie without Ben Burtt's sound design. Uh, with Cube, I had uh, a friend who had a PhD in statistics who conceptually designed the maze. When I did Splice, I had a, another friend who was a geneticist who consulted with me in the early stages, and then later on, actually paid a few geneticists uh, to work on the film, and one of them is actually in the movie. And so in some ways, the science led my fiction and inspired my fiction. On the other hand, at the end of the day, in my mind, science fiction is fantasy. And for me personally, it's, it's always about uh, metaphor and is a way of extrapolating on our reality in an indirect way. It's, it, it's invariably, it's a process. I think you have to respond to it in a very uh, gut emotional level. Those movies that really work, uh, are the ones that create a world and, and where the, the filmmakers have gone much further than what is just on the written page or what is on the screen and conceiving what that world would be.
approach for a second. There, you can see the soft landing rockets fire. And just our first look at the returned crew. Thumbs up from Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield. Science fiction inspires the real world, and new science is born. And science inspires storytelling, and on the circle goes. Whether science fact or science fiction, landing on the moon or creating a new planet, there is one consistency, us, the human race. We work together to discover, to create, to further our existence and to comment on it. Fact or fiction, it all comes down to exploring the vastness.